Merci beaucoup pour euh, l'introduction, Nilo. Euh, je vais faire ma présentation en anglais parce qu'il faut vraiment que je me prépare pour PyCon. Euh, mais bon, comme vous voyez, euh, je parle français. Donc, si jamais vous avez des questions à la fin, n'hésitez pas à la poser dans la langue qui vous met le plus à l'aise, tant que c'est le français ou l'anglais. Voilà. <rires> euh, donc... Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Françoise Provencher. I'm a data science technical lead at Shopify, and today I'm going to talk about uh, what we do. Um, so yeah, I said Shopify. Uh, we're not a music streaming company. <laughs> Uh, we make commerce better for everyone. So uh, what does that mean? What that means? Um, so I think we're mostly known for our uh, e-commerce platform, but uh, you can use Shopify to sell online or in person. So whether you have a retail brick and mortar shop or um, you want to just sell online. Um, but if you know Shopify already, you might be thinking, Francoise, what are you doing at Uh, you know, a Python meetup. I thought you guys were doing just Ruby on Rails. And, uh, well, I mean, you're right. Uh, Shopify is one of the biggest and, well, largest and uh, oldest uh, Ruby on Rails application. Uh, and most of our engineering department uses it on a daily basis. Um, most of them, but not all of them. Because in data science and engineering, there is at least 150 people that use Python on a daily basis. Um, our whole data, uh, data warehouse is powered by PySpark. And uh, at PyCon, uh, I will share the stage with my colleague um, Chris Fournier, who's a data engineer at Shopify, and he will talk a bit more about that. So it's going to be probably, I hope, uh, taped. So if you ever want to, to see a stock uh, in a couple of weeks when they are released. But today I'm going to talk more about the data science aspects. And um, it's not only about the tool, it's also about the community. Um, so I personally, uh, I'm one of the organizers of PyLeads Montreal. Uh, my colleague um, at, at Shopify, uh, Catherine, is the organizer of PyLeads at uh, Toronto. Uh, The sound guy tonight uh, works with me, uh, <laughs> and um, and also we we host um, the Ottawa Python meetup, um, and even the guy who organized PyCon US in Montreal works at Shopify. So I, I think the the people in this organization really care about the the community, and we're we're really present, um, and so that's why we're um, sponsoring PyCon this year as well. Um, Also, um, the library that Tristan talked about, uh, Lifelines, was created by one of our coworkers. Uh, we use it internally, but it's also available uh, externally. And uh, you know, we, we have a, a couple other um, libraries that are open sourced, and people also, um, you know, in their free time, um, contribute to the the libraries um, in Python. So I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of what we do on a daily basis as a data scientist, because data scientist is like a really broad term. Um, so one of the things that we do is ETL, uh, extract, transform, load. Uh, it's interesting because I think that in some companies you have ETLs engineers and then the data scientists only touch the data once it's you know, it's cleaned and it's, it's available. Uh, while we are also responsible um, for you know, the, the collection of the data and the cleaning. So in, in the ETL, uh, we write uh, PySpark jobs to, um, you know, transform the data with the business rules to, to clean it and to um, put it in um, the data front room, uh, well, the front room of the, the database uh, for everyone to use uh, in the company. So um, I really like it because when I'm building my models, I know exactly how the data was clean and I'm also empowered to go and look in the code because like everyone, you know, uh, in our job, we, we know PySpark. So it's easy to know when something is wonky um, to deep dive and figure out what it is. Um, As data scientists, we also do A-B experiments. So um, that is something that you do when you want to figure out Um, is feature A better than feature B? Um, so that can be uh, done, say, when you, before you release uh, a new version of something, or you're just really curious and you want to know, uh, you know, should we uh, put a little icon of a padlock so that people feel more secure <laughs> during a checkout or not? Uh, so this is a, a screenshot of, um, of what it looked like. The, the whole, um, um, you know, backend is in Python. 
And I'm just showing the um, conversion rates here, but we also have the survival analysis one, and that uses lifelines. Uh, we also have a team that is uh, completely dedicated to uh, creating recommender systems. Um, so if you're a merchant and you need to uh, find the best theme or the best apps, uh, we will recommend them for you. So uh, we do personalization um, of the product um, via recommender systems. So the data scientists are not just working you know, for the business, giving insights to the business, but we also are software developers. We create those products. Um, another example um, of a data product here um, would be product classification. So to make sure that we, hmm, so I would say that our data products internally really helps us um, create more value for, um, for other data products. So for instance, uh, well, th this is a, I, I have a t-shirt shop, so I <laughs> just put it there. Um, so let's say that you, you're selling t-shirts, um, but there's no way that Shopify would know that you're selling t-shirts because you haven't told us. Right, we have to infer it from the title, from the description, from the image, and we do uh, machine learning on that to um, create a data set to know um, all the products at Shopify, what kind of products they are, and based on that, then we can give better recommendations um, for the merchants themselves, either if that's a uh, you know, recommendation of where to um, market their product, for instance, or um, you know, how to price them. And I'm going to talk today mostly about exploratory data analysis because that's a huge part of uh, what I personally do these days. Uh, I'm now part of the um, systems research team. So we're a mixed method teams. Um, I'm the only data scientist on that team. The others are UX researchers uh, and um, yeah, doing a lot of exploratory data analysis. But before I go on, uh, I just want to check in with you. Are you comfortable on your chair? Because I'm five foot two, and when I sit on a conference chair like this, um, usually my feet don't really touch the ground. <laughs> it's super uncomfortable. Like after 10 minutes, I'm all <laughs> trying, trying to, to get more comfortable. And, um, and I mean, like this, this would fit like most people, but not all people. Um, Luckily, uh, I mean, I, I spend at least eight hours a day uh, seated <laughs> on a chair, uh, but it looks more like this. Uh, this comes in three different sizes. I have the solid size small. Um, my feet touch the ground. I, I can adjust, uh, you know, there, there's something like 12 different adjustments that you can make on a chair like that. Um, but it really takes into account that I'm a bit different than you know, someone else. Um, and my point here is that one size does not fit all, right? If you want to create a great product, you have to think that your users are a little bit different from each other. Um, and you have to have a way, like a mental model to think about them. So, you know, next time you uh, buy a software, do you want a software that looks like this or a software that looks like this, right? So my point here, um, is that there's a lot of value in segmenting a user base. So that's what I'm going to talk about for most of the talk. I'm just going to take a little sip because it's a long talk. All right. So this is our user base. Um, let's segment it. Um, we can maybe you know, cut it in two. People with long hair on one side, short hair on the other side might make sense. Like, let's say that you're a shampoo company, that might make sense. Um, but there's maybe, you know, something like this, like people with glasses, people wearing hats. I'm not sure exactly what's the best way to uh, segment all those users. And the point is that there is not a single right answer either. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through um, a methodology that um, multiple people have <laughs> used in my company. Um, and it worked pretty well. So the purpose of our segmentation is to create a mental model for the product team to think about, uh, well, entrepreneurs, because like our, our users at Shopify are entrepreneurs. And the idea would be to find two to five groups uh, using a method that is called clustering. 
And why two to five? It's because you know we want to create this mental model. So if you, we have 150, like the meetings with the product managers <laughs> will never end, <laughs> right? So you you want to have like something that people can you know have in their head at all times. Uh, those groups need to be big enough. Uh, what I mean is that like we we don't care that much about the 20 people in a corner if we have like half a million people here. Um, so they, they must be big enough to make sense, um, but also you know small enough to 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 bring some color to to the way that we want to understand our users. And the most important point is actually they need to be interpretable, because you know you can throw as many features and as many you know clustering algorithms you want at your data, but the end goal is really to have this mental model. So if it's not interpretable, you really miss the mark. Um, and we'll see that it's uh, actually a very important part of the process. And also, as uh, Tristan uh, talked before, uh, the workflow is real, but the data is fake. So um, the tool I will be uh, using for this is called Jupyter Notebook. I really love it. Um, if you've never used it before, um, check it out. Um, it is in your browser. And you can have a markdown um, to do some text editing, take notes. It's great if you're a scientist because then you have like all your methodology along with your code, which is super great. Um, you have your code, and when you execute it, the output is um, printed right below. So you have everything in one, um, and it's called a notebook. So check it out. So uh, step zero because uh, you know it's the first step in Python, we start counting at zero. Uh, bring some features with your colleagues. And um, that's super important because garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and what are the features? Um, so let's say that I want to segment my user base, I will talk, say, with um, a designer and ask them, you know, what's on your mind uh, about your product? And maybe they will say something like, um, I don't know. I, I I don't know if I should um, put this element up or or here, or if this thing should be drag and drop, or if uh, people are okay with writing code, or um, you know if we should make it easier to add different variants to this product page and, and things like that. So um, so cool. You you've talked to to one designer. Um, maybe talk also to a product managers because they have uh, well they will be your clients at the end, so they have also pretty strong. Um, opinions on that. Um, if you have UX researchers in your organization, UX researchers are a great source of um, information, especially because they, you know, they have anecdotes from talking to a lot of merchants. They, they've done interviews, they've done surveys. They maybe already have, you know, a ton of CSV files that are not even in your database that you can reuse. Um, and they, they have a lot of empathy for the users, so they're a really great source. But if you're in a small company and you don't necessarily have UX researchers, talk with the, um, um, the people in the customer support. They talk with, your <laughs> with the end users uh, the most, and they have a, a really good idea of what is easy to do, what is not easy to do, and the different types of people that they interact with. So um, you know, at this stage of a project, the risk is all the unknowns unknowns. So uh, by talking with people, this is how like, you, you figure out those unknown unknowns, and then you get, uh, well, they become knowns, basically. Then step one, um, get data from, from multiple sources. As I said, you might have already survey data floating around in a CSV file, and you might have a colleague that has already did an ETL job that would uh, dump a very nice data set in the front room in a database. Uh, but you might also have you know, petabytes of data uh, on HDFS, and you want to exploit that. So um, once you have your grocery list of features, um, you can go in and uh, put them all together. So just uh, import pandas. And at Shopify, we have something that's called star screen, uh, which is basically our um, ETL pipelines. Um, so the, the read method will um, just help me read a, um, a folder on HDFS uh, to have it as a PySpark data frame. Um, so cool, with pandas, I can read from a CSV. So this is where I got my survey data. We have this very cool thing <laughs> that the, the data engineers made. So it's, um, it's a Python command that you can um, pass um, a string that is SQL, and it will return a pandas data frame, which is uh, super useful. 
Uh, and you can, um, you know, use the read method, get a PySpark data frame, then do your heavy uh, manipulation. So here, say I'm grouping by, say, shop ID. This might be, you know, the data itself might be too big to fit in memory, but uh, since it's, uh, it's in PySpark, my cluster will, you know, take care of it, aggregate, and then return it to me um, in a pandas data frame as well, and then I can join everything together. So, like, a, a few years ago, this was not possible <laughs> uh, where, where I work. Um, but now we have all this cool tooling, so, you know, in a few lines of code, I, I have all the data uh, I want in one big uh, data set, in this case, a pandas data frame. Um, so my step two would be just the basic cleaning, you know, removing rows, so maybe in my survey, uh, the survey was localized, so I just want to keep, um, you know, the, the rows of the users that answered in English. I want to remove some columns. Uh, so for instance, like a lot of questions are, um, you know, other please specify. I don't necessarily want those for, for my clustering. So I will just remove them. And most importantly, uh, dealing with missing values. Uh, this is where like you need to use your, your judgment. Um, but in my case, I just replace uh, the missing values with did not answer because this is what happens in my survey. Um, but maybe in your application, it would mean that it, it, it would be okay to say replace all the not a number by a zero, for instance. Or maybe it's not okay and you should really remove those rows. So you have to, to know your data, to know what is appropriate to do here. But in my case, I just um, replace it with did not answer. Step three, do more feature engineering because now you have uh, your, your feature that were given to you basically um, by your database. But a lot of times uh, a good feature might be an interaction between two other features. So for instance, um, uh, well, I talked about variants and products. So let's say uh, my product is a a cardigan like this, and the variants might be, uh, you know, five different sizes and five different colors, so I have 25 different variants. Um, versus uh, someone that sells uh, something else, maybe microphones, and uh, there's only one of this kind, or maybe two because you have, like, different voltages or something like that. So maybe the needs of those you know, of people who sell a lot of variants is different because the product complexity is not the same. So maybe that's an hypothesis that I have, and maybe I want to have this feature in my data set. Well, it's pretty easy. You just add it. Um, so I find that a, a ratio, say, of variants to products um, would be a, an interesting feature to have. So uh, that's something you can keep in mind. Uh, think about, like, you know, what are the features that would be interesting to have as ratios? Um, other ideas, um, bucketing, especially if you have um, categorical data, you can put them into buckets. <laughs> That's what I call bucketing. Um, differences, uh, especially uh, with uh, time, a bit like what um, uh, Tristan said a bit before. Maybe you're not that much interested in the date that people started something and they stopped doing something or did something else. Maybe you're interested in the duration between those two events. So uh, think about differences. And I put logarith logarithm uh, in there because sometimes um, you know, things just scale logarithmically. Um, so for instance, I don't know, some physical things like like the, the, the power of, uh, of sound or um, other things like that, or like the, the perception of sound is uh, logarithmic, so you might want to, you know, if you have the, just like the acoustic pressure, you might want to take the logarithm of that instead, or, you know, things like that. Um, Cool. Then, now that we have all this data, you have all kinds of numbers in there. Uh, and some of those numbers might be really big and others really small. So if you want your uh, clustering algorithm to work, you need to put everything in like, you know, in, in, in a nice range. Um, so one of the first thing um, I like to do is if I have Categorical data. So let's say do you have a retail location. You have maybe three different answers. Uh, you can do one hot encoding that is also called um, dummy variables. Um, and in so I, I think it depends on 
in which community uh, you are. Um, I don't know why, like my colleagues call it one hot, one hot encoding, but in uh, Pandas it's actually called get dummies. Um, but that what it will do, it will um, create three different um, uh, columns with ones and zeros depending on uh, if uh, the user had this attribute. So um, it's pretty cool because now um, I can give this to an algorithm because it's numbers, while in the first case uh, it would not have worked. So um, you do that. Um, and if you have other things like um, you know, numbers uh, that are not between 0 and 1, for instance, uh, you want to, to scale them. Um, so here I just have a, an example. So maybe you have the number of apps that a store installed, um, but instead of having the values between 5 and 15, you might want to have them between 0 and 1. And this is very um, useful that scikit-learn has a lot of different um, scalers. Um, I like the min-max scaler because I like things to be between 0 and 1. But um, you know, you, you might uh, prefer another one depending on your application. And now, dimensionality reduction. If you've ever done machine learning, you've heard of this, uh, the curse of dimensionality. Um, I recently did some clustering on my um, survey data. I had something like 100 different uh, dimensions. And you know, when you are in high dimensions, your um, your distance matrix, your Euclidean uh, distance, uh, start to lose sense because uh, in 100 dimension, it's just like everything kind of looks the same. So you really have to uh, reduce it to um, less dimensions. So something that is pretty, c um, um, yeah, that the, that people do very often is using a PCA. Principal component analysis. So here I've just uh, plotted uh, the number of components and um, cumulative explained variance. So that's what usually people uh, look at. So basically, what it shows is that you don't necessarily need to keep all of your um, of your features because you know you would get most of it right. Um, but I kind of like to also dabble a little bit in this. Um, and see, like in just you know, in just two uh, components, just two dimensions, can I get away uh, with a pretty nice clustering? And then uh, we'll use k-means for this. Uh, so if you've done some um, probably Coursera class, or if you use a scikit learn before, uh, the very classic example is with the iris data set. So that's maybe what you have in mind uh, when you think about, let's cluster something. Um, it looks like this. You have you know, three classes that are pretty well separated from one another, maybe not the two in the middle, but you know, there's one that's pretty different. Um, and yeah, and you might apply, you know, a couple different. Um, um, what do you say? Um, you know, ways to look at how your clustering is good, such as the silhouette score or the kalinsky arabra score or the sum of um, of means inside your clusters, and it will all look good, and it, you will always have like the nice elbow or the nice peak for those things. But what I've seen in the wild looks <laughs> more like this. Um, so um, people, um, people are on a really interesting spectrum <laughs> of behaviors and of um, tastes and of um, personalities. You don't have, let's say, uh, you know, be because otherwise you just have stereotypes, you know, <laughs> like. Uh, big heavy metal guy and like little something something right it, it 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 doesn't work like that with with people you don't necessarily have big clusters what you have is basically the spectrum like this whole pie and your goal here is just to slice it in the way that makes the most sense but it doesn't mean that there is one way to slice the pie correctly it doesn't mean that there is well-defined um, clusters 
and uh, that's why I've put this quote here, that the goal is that the objects in a group should be similar to uh, one another and different from the objects in other groups. But in many application, clusters are not well separated from one another. So if you've never done uh, machine learning and you thought that people that were doing it were super geniuses, uh, they just know those three lines. <laughs> 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 So, so actually, the hard part about machine learning is everything that I said before. It's like the pre you know preparing the data and doing the the feature engineering and how you're going to interpret it afterwards and all that kind of knowledge around it. But actually, like the implementation in Python, like if you're doing like simple stuff like like k-means, uh, it's it's really just that. Now I have my clusters. Uh, and so when I have my clusters, it kind of looks like this. So I have my, you know, what hot encoded uh, features. Uh, you know, I've. It's I only kept three because otherwise it wouldn't fit right. here, um, and the the number of um, my cluster. And the number is is pretty meaningless. It just is just, um, you know, one of the colors that we we've seen before, and that makes the interpretation part a really um, important part. Um, so the way that I found it was working really well for us was to do something that my colleague calls indexing. Um, so what we mean by that is that, um, remember like all my data, um, no, actually that's not true. Yes, okay, let me start that again. Um, so if you take your cluster data and you group it by cluster, um, you can take the mean of that thing. And then you can subtract the mean and normalize. So basically, everything that will be at zero will be, you know, uh, this is normal for my group. If you're closer to one, you will be, you know, over indexing for that group. That means that it you your group is is doing this thing more than the others. And if you're at minus one, it means that your group is doing this thing less than the other groups. Um, depending on your application, like for me, this works really well because all my data is um, between zero and one and I don't have like a lot of outliers. Uh, you can use the median instead. The, the, the idea is to find like what's your baseline? Is your baseline like the median for this thing or the mean? Then you put everyone there and, and then you, you don't even have to put between um, people between zero and one, but I, I kind of like it because then you can uh, it's easier for me to, to interpret. But that's the main idea. Um, and also something very, very cool um, that I learned recently is that you can apply styles to <laughs> your um, data frames, which makes uh, my life much easier. So here I'm just saying, okay, if um, you know the value is smaller than 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5, it will be red. Otherwise, um, if it's larger than 0.5 it would be green and this will just uh, makes my life a bit make my life a bit easier when i try to interpret my data and it looks like this um, when i do it i usually have you know maybe a uh, hundred different <laughs> features um, so um, so this is really cool because now i can see at a glance that say cluster one is uh, a cluster of merchants who would use um, they're, well, it's, it's a full-time business. They have a physical store, so that means they are a retailer. Uh, they had business experience before, and they have at least one employee. So like, to me, this looks like really like my, you know, I have this image in my head of like my, my neighborhood retailer um, that have, you know, their physical store. Well, if I look at cluster zero, uh, their business is not full-time, so they're part-time. They don't have a physical store. Um, and they do have an online store, so they're online only. Uh, they are using media, social media channels, uh, and they don't really have a business experience before, and they don't have an employee. So th that, that looks like me more like someone that has maybe, you know, a hobby that they want to turn into profit using um, an online store uh, or something like that. So, so what I will do, I would look at something like this and take notes and try to, to draw a picture around that. And if it's something that totally makes sense, um, 
then I will go back and, and talk about it with my coworkers. If it totally doesn't make sense, <laughs> I go back and rethink about my, my features. Um, yeah. And step nine, uh, oh, did I skip a step? Darn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, tell people um, because it, when you're, um, you know, when you're in a a role where you're doing research, um, you know, you could have done all that research and never tell anyone, but but then nothing will change. That's not how you have impact. You know, it's you can't just write on your CV, oh, I've done like ten clustering things if you've never presented it to someone and it actually changed the way the business works. So I find that as a data scientist, you really need to uh, get out of your uh, introverted self <laughs> and get out there and, and talk to people and uh, really make a change in your organization or whatever project you're doing uh, with by communicating that data. And sometimes communicating that data means uh, you're showing a you know, a pie chart. I hope you're not using pie charts, but if that works for influencing people, do it. Um, like in our case, uh, this is actually, well, I, I've blurred uh, the sensitive parts, um, but we can make a kind of a personal card like this to, um, so next time I talk with a use uh, with a, say, a product manager, I could say, like, oh, like the way that your product will impact uh, brick and mortar business, and this is what we mean by a brick and mortar business. Uh, it's people that have their, their main focus is their in-store experience. Uh, they're not really uh, worrying about their online store, what they need to succeed, what they struggle with, what are their goals, uh, and some maybe key metrics at the top that, that we've blurred there. But that's just one way to, um, to present them. Um, but so far, it works pretty well to do it that way. Um, also, I would say if you have, um, you know, a channel in your company to do um, talks, uh, either like I don't know, a Friday with a beer, get in front of everyone and present them this kind of thing, or just book a meeting with the appropriate people. But you need to get the word out. So, in conclusion. Um, doing this kind of segmenter, uh, segmentation uh, uses a great deal of domain knowledge, so that's why we talk to everyone <laughs> in the first place, and uh, also some uh, pretty darn cool data science skills, um, but also something that is maybe I haven't said explicitly so far, uh, but you've probably sensed it with all the cool tools that I use is that I'm empowered to do this kind of work with the scale of data um, because I work with a team of data engineers. Um, you know, for, for instance, like my um, IPython notebook, uh, Jupyter notebook runs on a cluster that is maintained by someone else, which is amazing because in my previous job I was uh, you know, I, I was maintaining my own cluster and that was like a, a lot of time when things go wrong. So I really like to have a team and people to lean on to take care of that kind of problems or that kind of, uh, of challenges. And also they create like those awesome tools like the um, Presto query that I can use to, uh, to query the database. So that's it for me. Thank you. Je peux prendre les questions en français ou en anglais? Oui. I was really surprised. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but you threw out like all your dimensions except two. Uh, and that, that gave you like, what, 10% of the variability? Or 5% of the variability was in two dimensions? Yeah, so, uh, so you're talking about the PCA? Yeah. Right. So um, it's not, so are, are you familiar with PCA? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Indeed, and the thing is that um, even if you're in a, you know, be because, okay, so what I usually do, <laughs> and I didn't necessarily have the, the time to, to go through the, the whole process here, uh, I will use things like a silhouette score to, to look like if we do see some structure in higher dimension that I can see with my eyes, um, and I will try at different, um, 
number of PCA components and um, or variants, like kind of like what, what you want to look at it, and see if the interpretation changes. Uh, but sometimes the interpretation doesn't change that much. Um, so it really depends. And what I've noticed is that when I don't show enough, I don't show away uh, enough um, components, you, you can start to have really weird ways. Like, um, I don't know, sometimes it just picks up on, uh, is this, peop is are people using Twitter for something as, you know, uh, wha what kind of merchants do we have? Like, this is not really relevant. So it's either that I have a problem with my, um, my features in the first place, this might not be a feature that should be there, or uh, maybe that I have too many, um, you know, too many features. Um, I really like to at least reject some of them because that acts kind of as a noise reduction. Um, but yeah, so as I said, um, in this kind of thing, um, interpretation is really my metric. Um, because the other typical metrics that you would have actually don't necessarily work. Uh, so uh, I see that after you cut the clusters you and you recenter them, you also normalize the maximum. So does this mean the uh, variance between the different clusters doesn't really matter? So if you divide, they're all between minus one and one. Then uh, if one cluster originally had more variance than the other, you lose this information, right? But it's not important? Or? Yeah, so it, it depends on your application. There's different kinds of um, scalars. Uh, some of them will um, re reduce all the... So, so k-means um, actually makes the assumption that your variance is kind of the same for all your clusters. Um, so it kind of makes sense to rescale it that way. Yeah, but on the other hand, like I said, um, you know, in with this type of thing, whoop, there's not, you know, there's not only one way to, so, 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 so the whole point is like more to have kind of a, a data informed way to get to those, um, to get to those user segments rather than have say, um, you know, just one assumption that, oh yeah, like we have retailers, we have people doing online stuff, and we have this. Well, when we use this um, this kind of uh, procedure in practice, we find uh, like more nuanced and more rich things that we can then dig into. And actually, um, you know, to get to that point where we have a personal card, um, it's also about going out and interviewing people or like making sure that you know, so, so I, 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 I kind of sense that the people that do machine learning are like, what are you doing? Like, with you, you, you don't really have clusters in there. Um, but the the point is to really get to a point where you know you can group people in ways that kind of make sense, and in practice, this works. Mm. Yeah, that's the point. Um, so the question was, um, can we use this, or like, do we use this to um, make predictions? And actually, yes. So um, survey data is hard to get, or expensive to get, or it's small data. So um, we uh, often find those clusters with like this very rich data, and also use um, other signals from the database in there, and then use that to um, figure out like what ways we could label. So for instance, like recently we had a survey when people would um, self-label themselves as say business models. Well, I have a label data set that I can use um, to cluster and then to project that. Um, but in that case, um, since I have labels, I won't just use clustering because that's an unsupervised um, method. I'm also using other like supervised uh, machine learning methods. 
You said you had the second. Yeah, how much, what's your typical size of the data set? Say you're writing a cluster, you're writing a cluster, how big of data do you generally use? So how big are our data sets? So, um, so for a user base, um, I think it's um, public knowledge that we're uh, over 600,000 600, uh, users. Uh, so if we're going to run uh, clustering on, on everyone, that would be the number of rows. Uh, it, uh, it works in memory. Uh, for things like um, the recommender systems, that you know, I, I wouldn't do that. And in a, a Jupyter notebook, uh, just with uh, you know, in memory with uh, with pandas, that would use a uh, PySpark for it, and uh, other machine learning libraries that work well uh, for that. So um, I have uh, lots of colleagues that use TensorFlow, for instance. Do we have more questions? Yes. Yes. Last, last, if you did some exploratory analysis, may have. Comment, j'imagine que, en fait, la, moi j'ai des questions sur le step zero, en fait. Où tu parles avec, uh, like, mm -hmm. step zero being talk with my team. Brainstorm features with your colleagues. Uh, As-tu un exemple uh, d'un brainstorm qui t'a amené, tu sais, de, de vraiment de step zero jusqu'à step, bah, sans, sans repasser par step nine, mais une feature que vous avez discuté, qui t'a fait de la, de la de, Comment est-ce que tu vas véritablement amener de l'exploratory analysis à une feature ce qui va rouler entre le Jupyter Notebook, très pratique pour faire son analyse, puis après d'amener ça à un pipeline en production qui roule à tous les jours avec... Euh, comme, like, how do you ship it? How do you ship it? <laughs> C'est une très bonne question. <laughs> C'est un bon talk. <laughs> <laughs> non, mais c'est euh, une excellente question. Um, si j'ai un bon exemple de ça... Euh, ben c'est ça. Quand je parle de, de features, ici, je parle de... J'aurais peut-être dû être plus explicite. Je parle de, de, de features qui vont être, dans le fond, mes, mes inputs à mon, euh, à mon euh, machine learning model. Je ne parlais pas nécessairement de features comme de features de, 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 de software, mais c'est quand même une, une, super bonne, euh, une super bonne question. Euh, mm, mm, mm. Pas, en, en fait, je dirais pas dans ce cas-ci, euh, parce que... Um, oui, parce qu'on les a surtout utilisés pour des choses comme, euh, par exemple, recruter des, euh, des gens pour des, des surveys ou pour, euh, mettons, dire, euh, on, on a fait euh, X nombre de... Euh, on fait aussi du hardware, puis on veut, disons, le faire tester par des gens, puis on veut être sûr que ce n'est pas juste la même sorte de gens qui vont avoir le hardware dans les mains, on veut comme que ce soit un petit peu plus... Euh, un petit peu plus balancé, fait qu'on va utiliser ça, par exemple, euh, une fois. Um, mais j'ai fait d'autres projets qui n'étaient pas nécessairement du, du clustering de, de gens comme ça qui sont en, en production. Puis je te dirais que c'est euh, quand même toute une job. <rire> le, le, le delta d'énergie que ça prend entre euh, avoir un prototype qui fonctionne sur euh, moins de data dans Pandas, um, versus quelque chose qui va rouler à tous les jours puis qui ne va jamais failer, puis que ton ton modèle. Parce que quand tu veux mettre quelque chose en production, il faut que tu fasses attention à plein d'autres choses. <rire> euh, parce qu'il peut commencer à faire des mauvaises prédictions. Il euh, faut que tu sois capable de le monitorer dans ce cas-là. Euh, ça prend une équipe au complet. Si je pars en vacances, euh, <rire> il faut qu'il y ait quelqu'un d'autre qui soit capable de, 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 de faire. Donc, on a des pipelines de machine learning en production, euh, mais c'est euh, vraiment, vraiment plus de, de travail que euh, ça. Ici, c'est plus comme euh, comment arriver à un prototype. Parce que le, le, le but de ce que je fais, ce serait de le mettre en production aussi, mais... Ah, c'est Python l'année prochaine. Ouais. <rire> en fait, j'ai des collègues qui ont, qui ont mis un, un truc, j'ai fait un prototype, puis ils l'ont mis en production, mais ça a pris quand même un bout de temps. Parce que c'est ça, il fallait, euh, fallait construire tout le, le monitoring euh, autour. C'est super important, tu ne veux pas que ton algorithme commence à faire des niaiseries en production. Euh, mais maintenant que ça, c'est fait, après ça, toutes les autres qu'on va faire vont être plus simples. Bon, S'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, ben merci beaucoup.